Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone is adequately refueled, which brings us in a nice segue into the sponsored event from Refueling Solutions and Gemina and Race for 2030. Refueling Solutions is essentially a diesel supply and logistics company. We deliver diesel requirement to customers, 6,500 customers throughout Australia, every state in Australia excepting Tasmania at this point. Within that framework of diesel supply and delivery is a firm commitment to the next generation of energy, liquid diesel, biodiesel, and of late renewable diesel. This isn't new technology, it has been around for a long time. And if I can refer back to the founder and inventor of the diesel engine, Mr. Rudolf Diesel, coincidentally, his initials are RD, and quite ironic that we are now looking at RD, renewable diesel. He was a curious man when it came to so-called heat engines. He even designed a solar powered air engine. In 1900, in Paris at the World Trade Fair, he first ran and demonstrated his diesel engine on peanut oil. His inventions all centered around three common areas, the transference of heat based on natural processes and laws of physics. They had creative mechanical designs and were motivated by his concept of sociological needs. At the time, enabling independent craftsmen and artisans to compete with large industry. Rudolf Diesel would be right at home today, working to develop new fuels and energy sources to tackle major sociological need and meeting the challenge of climate change. Indeed, thousands of engineers around the world are doing just that, reducing emissions and making technology more efficient and boosting performance. Today is just another step in a long journey that has been exhibited and experienced by many in the room and some new faces as well. I'd like to introduce the next speaker and look forward to discussing any need going forward for not just diesel requirement, but bioenergy. And we must all work collaboratively on that path to net zero. And we should all embrace and encompass each other's technologies and desire and willingness to meet those targets. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name's uh, Simon Roycroft. I'm the manager of Future Fuels uh, Division at, at Refueling Solutions, and of late, the chair of the Clean. Uh, Clean Fuels Alliance for Bioenergy Australia. It is with great pleasure that I'm able to chair this session, a very important one and one that's close and dear to our heart, as, as Cliff has captured. Renewable diesel decarbonising construction, marine, mining, agriculture, rail and heavy haulage. It's a fairly significant area that we have to operate in. Today we have a stellar lineup of speakers, many of whom I've had the pleasure of working with. Uh, first hand, I guess, to experience the amazing work they tirelessly undertake on a daily basis. And I think for anyone who's at the coalface of the industry, it has certainly not been uh, one of the easiest journeys that we've had to go on. So firstly, in the role of the Cleaner Fuel Alliance, or the role of the Cleaner Fuel Alliance, I thought it would be appropriate to give you some understanding about some of the things that we've got, got up to or getting up to. So Bioenergy Australia works with uh, the other alliances, RGA, Renewable Gas Alliance, Sustainable Aviation Fuel Alliance of Australia and New Zealand, and, and ourselves, the Cleaner Fuel Alliance. These alliances were founded to accelerate the development and deployment of renewable liquid fuels and biomethane for deployment in Australia. We're there to assist in the development of the annual advocacy strategy relating to cleaner fuels, provide advice on the opportunities and challenges for the cleaner fuel uh, sectors in Australia, drive forward opportunities 
uh, contribute to the preparation of submissions to government. And for those of you who are part of Bioenergy Australia, there's been no shortage of documentation coming through. We also engage with the membership in knowledge sharing and advise topics for seminars, meetings, workshops, webinars, and website information. <clears throat> I think this has got a little bit longer than I last, last remember this list, but anyway. Of particular note, um, <clears throat> I would also encourage you to have a look at our uh, latest report prepared by Deloitte, uh, the hosts of today. Um, very enlightening, transitioning Australia's liquid fuel sector, the role of renewable fuels. So that's something we're quite proud of, and as an organisation has been the, I think it would be fair to say, the most successful and influential piece of work that's been commissioned. <clears throat> so in conclusion, I'd say there is no doubt that in hard to abate diesel intensive sectors that we'll, be, uh, we'll hear about today, the immediacy and simplicity of renewable low carbon liquid fuels are extreme or is extremely attractive. So whether that's renewable diesel, biodiesel, ethanol, it just makes sense. And not just as an intermediary step, I think more and more as other aspirational technologies evolve, there will be a long road ahead for low carbon liquid fuels. When you can use existing equipment that's got at least five to 10, if not more years available of useful life, particularly in the shipping, mining, rail sectors. And with the existing refuelling infrastructure, with abatements that are achievable in the range of 82 to 90% and potentially more, the word compelling comes to mind about the role of liquid fuels. Now, I'd like to invite the first speaker, uh, Abigail, uh, the National Sustainability Manager, Strategic Projects for Lendlease, who will talk about fossil-free construction. Following Abigail will be uh, Mark Hammonds from the Trucking Institute, uh, Amy Philbrook from Europe, and Fabio Chimenez. I got it. Uh, New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, Keith Sharp from TFA, and Shafak Raman from uh, Savitza Australia. So thank you guys. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Simon, and thank you to Bioenergy Australia for the opportunity to um, speak here today. I'm going to take a breath because I'm so honoured to be here that we're actually having this conversation about fuels. I feel we've had so much time talking about why we should de decarbonise, and finally we're getting into the space of how. So I find this really exciting to be a part of this uh, today. Oh, that's fine. So I'm from Lendlease, and in 2020, we set our mission zero. This is to achieve net carbon um, emissions by 2025 for our scope one and scope two emissions, and absolute zero by 2040, which is reducing our emissions for scope one, two, and three without the use of offsets. So here is a high level roadmap of how we plan to uh, achieve our absolute zero by 2040. It's on our website, tiny writing, you don't have to read that all now. But what we're gonna talk about is this top line here. This is the zero use of fossil fuels in construction and the context of what I'm talking about today. So our emissions from construction are material. 23% of global emissions come from construction and 5.5 of those come from the fossil fuels powering the machinery and equipment. So for us in Lend Lease, that's primarily diesel. So I think the yellow machines running around. So we partnered with University of Queensland on looking on how we could actually make a pathway to get to um, absolute zero relating to our construction machinery. So University of Queensland undertook an extensive literature review of technologies that are available, energy sources. They looked at European examples. They also looked at policy mechanisms. And there's a database that's all free to access on machinery, so low and zero emission construction machinery. So we took all that research. Um, we engaged deeply with our supply chain and we held workshops to look at how we take the theory or the actual um, work from UQ and contextualize that into the construction activities that we undertake daily on our projects. And from this process, we identified preferred options and pathways and the key barriers and enabling enablers to that. And that's all synthesized in the report, Stepping Up the Pace Fossil Fuel Free Construction, which there's a link at the end. So to um, 
just to confirm what we looked at, so we looked at the two sides of the coin, technology and the energy sources. So we looked at electric, uh, wired and battery electric. We looked at hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cell and energy storage. We also looked at energy sources, so the grid, hydrogen, biodiesel, renewable diesel, bioethanol and biomethane. So for us with a high use of diesel in the um, biofuel space, we looked very much at biodiesel and renewable diesel. So I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir a bit here, but just so everyone's at the same point. So biodiesel um, is made from a process called transesterification, and we um, can use that in our construction machinery, but we seem to top out at about 20% blend with mineral diesel due to the requirements of the original equipment manufacturers from the machinery that we make. Renewable diesel made from the same renewable feedstocks. We've already talked about it today with SAF, very similar processes. Um, the advantage for us of renewable diesel is that we can drop it in as 100%. We don't get that sort of blending limit that we experience with biodiesel. So our original equipment manufacturers um, are happy for us to use that as 100% in our mach machinery. So what our research showed is that construction is a hard to abate sector and that achieving our mission zero target of absolute zero by 2040 requires the acceleration of electric construction machinery and equipment. The um, gravity of this was until we did this research, we weren't considered a hard to abate sector. We were often overlooked by um, government reports, um, a lot of other discussion pieces. So this finally, um, we're now finally talked about in this context. So our preferred pathway that we came up with through our research is to use um, electric construction machinery and equipment where available. This enables us with the use of renewable electricity to get to a zero emission um, outcome and renewable diesel to substitute mineral diesel where electric options are not available. And as we know, this we don't have a domestic um, industry here in Australia. So at the moment, we... Um, We'll come to an example, but this requires importing at a, at a high cost premium to use renewable diesel. I get asked this all the time. We feel hydrogen does have a place in other sectors, but what we found in our research was that there's a lack of hydrogen models of equipment and machinery. This excavator in the picture here is in a quarry in um, Europe. There's a couple of loaders, but really we can't, there's not enough equipment for us to change our fleets. Um, space constraints of using hydrogen on a day-to-day -day basis and we would need custom infrastructure for safe storage on site of hydrogen fuels and renewable hydrogen is a long way off. So what's our plan? Well, we're prioritising and advocating for electrification. We're advocating for renewable diesel and we're using biodiesel now as much as we can and renewable diesel as it upscales and becomes available. So we mapped out what the transition looks like. So from our research, so you can see here on um, the black moving across to the green. So the black are the diesel um, engines where we can use going into the blue biodiesel. We can use those in B5, B20. So for example, there, there's the generators readily take 20% uh, biodiesel in our experience um, across to electric machinery. So large cranes, concrete booms, um, hand tools and the smaller materials handling um, equipment. So as we move into what I call the messy middle, um, 2025, 26, we're hoping the first renewable diesel um, refineries will come into play in this country. So what we'll be finding is where biofuels and where renewable diesels are uh, geographically available, we're expecting that to be used as a big hodgepodge mix in our diesel internal combustion engines. And then you'll see on the electric that more um, equipment and machinery is electrifying. So the, the ranges are, are getting bigger in size and also more extensive. So, and then it smooths out, I feel like a bit of a weather forecast, so it smooths out into calm waters, hopefully, uh, for renewable diesel in 2030, where we're expecting um, a lot more um, models and makes to be available as electric options. And we'll still be having renewable diesel for the larger machinery, where we're not expecting the electrification to be an option. Just an example, um, electric excavators at the moment are available up to six or seven tonnes. We use 30, 40 tonnes, so we're expecting them to get higher as the technology gets smaller. A um, bit rubbery, but UQ um, has estimated that about 40% of our construction machinery um, by energy use will be electric by 2030, looking at 
percent. So the role for renewable diesel in this process um, is, is so critical as a transition fuel. You can see the electric will take time and to decarbonize now and the short term we very much need the renewable diesel as that transition fuel. And in that column there at 2040 what we're expecting to sit in that category is the really larger machinery, some of the bigger piling rigs and things that have that real grunt um, that may not come into other options. And at the bottom there's a generator icon because we still have this vicious circle of having to build and start constructing in sites that don't have mains power. So for that we we commonly um, power with uh, with generators. So we've begun, we've been on a journey. Um, we have some examples here of B20, which I'll go into more detail. In the middle there, you can see that um, alternative fuels policy, we're very envious of our European friends who have been using renewable diesel since January last year and are nearly at 100% on all our UK operations using all the same construction machinery that we use here. We have our one Sydney Harbour um, just across the way, I can almost see it from here, was our first project to try as fossil fuel free construction. And we um, think we're using the largest electric concrete pump um, in Australia for that project, which is traditionally a diesel um, activity. Parramatta I'll come to. And then going back to Queensland, Terry mentioned it before, I've come from Brisbane as well. And our Queensland Performing Arts Centre Surprise, uh, anticipation. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> um, so on our Queensland project, we actually have used renewable diesel in a 230-tonne Libra mobile crane. So we're really doing those test cases of where it's viable in different diesel contexts. And we've also tested our first um, battery there, which we use where we, that has substituted a diesel generator for powering a tower crane. So where we hit that issue of grid constraints. So here in New South Wales, our um, our Sydney Metro Martin Place project has used um, combinations of B20 and B5 blends in our machinery using, um, so we've used 11,000 litres in totals as those blends. And so you can see there with the different machinery, so the B20 and the big cranes, and then a lot of the smaller machines have been using the B5. So we had 30 tonnes of carbon emission savings. So this is your low hanging fruit. We can do this right now. This is like a, such an easy win to use biodiesel and construction machinery. And renewable diesel. So this is a power, uh, powerhouse, uh, powerhouse Parramatta. So we worked in partnership with Refueling Solutions, Mar Contracting, Multiplex and Infrastructure New South Wales to import the first batch of renewable diesel into the country. So that was in November. So we firsthand experienced a lot of the barriers of doing that import. So we are using it in three tower cranes and we're estimating when the project finishes mid next year, we would have used 85 and a half thousand litres, estimating to be 23, sorry, 230 tonnes of carbon emission savings from substituting that for um, mineral diesel. So um, we're very proud of that. It's a real industry leading initiative. So this has already been talked about in the SAF space. As you know, um, SAF keep refining comes to renewable diesel in the process, not chemical engineer, just caveat that. Um, so we have a lot of those say, same benefits that we talked about in the previous, section, uh, the previous session, lower air and noise um, pollution, growth in local industries and jobs, uh, stronger national energy security and lower fuel on them. So what can you do? Well, have a look at our report. Um, what in when you're anything in the procurement space so prioritize the use of electric construction machinery equipment and renewable diesel and where electric options are not available and we're finding um in the construction sector that all our state governments have carbon reduction targets but these don't translate into procurement uh, policy when they're procuring infrastructure so there's a real missed opportunity that we're not getting those um on the ground decarbonizing low carbon fuel outcomes from um all the dollars that are spent by government. Um, introducing construction uh, decarbonization, re decarbonization requirements, similar point again, and we need low carbon fuel policies. It's the same with SAF. We've got the same barriers. We, we need to advocate for the fuel policies and the funding into a domestic renewable diesel industry so that we can get that cost parity, not have to import with more than twice the cost, which is what we're experiencing at the moment. And um, yeah, 
we all need to do this together. lend can't decarbonise this industry on our own. We all need to come together to uh, decarbonise the sector. And here are the links, which I think this is being shared afterwards. So they're the online links. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm Mark Hammond. Uh, I'm the Chief Technical Officer at the Truck Industry Council. Uh, and just quickly, uh, the Truck Industry Council um, is uh, an organisation of truck manufacturers and major component suppliers to the trucking industry in Australia uh, for vehicles above three and a half tonne GVM. Um, we represent um, 16 brands of truck in Australia, um, and last year our members provided 99% of all trucks over four and a half ton GVM to uh, to the market in Australia. And our positioning statement is today's trucks are safer, greener, and essential. Uh, and that's um, the the brands. I'm sure you'll recognise sort of all of those. Um, their trucks running around sort of on on the roads today. Um, I guess what I want to talk about today is is the reality of um, abating um, carbon emissions in this this segment. A lot of people would probably think that it's it's easy to do, but for a host of reasons, it's it's not. Um, we have a, a general carbon abatement target, uh, 43% by 2030. Um, there doesn't seem to be any specific plan for transport. Uh, in Europe, there is actually a transport target of only 12%. The European target uh, holistically is 44%, so close to our 43% but they uh, recognise that transport and all forms of transport is uh, are quite difficult to abate and their actual target's only 12%. Um, we have a num number of barriers here in Australia currently. Our Australian design rules are inadequate to support low and zero emission vehicles. Um, they're being a, 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 a adapted, uh, sorry, um, the, the new regulations are being sort of gradually adopted, um, principally to align with Europe, but it's taking too long. We have state and territory laws that are inadequate to support zero emission vehicles, particularly sort of in terms of vehicle dimensions, width and length, quite restrictive compared to other markets in the world, uh, and axle mass um, limits need to be overhauled so we can um, uh, compensate for the increased weight of zero emission vehicles, be they battery electric or, or hydrogen. Um, and it's unlikely there's going to be a single energy or fuel replacement for diesel. It's going to have to be a combination of uh, different energy um, sources uh, and different technologies. So, um, and at the moment, there's no technical or economically viable electric or hydrogen alternative solution for many transport sectors in Australia. So line haul, remote area and mass constrained freight, there is no viable current solution and we don't see that there will be between now and 2030 probably sort of beyond that 2035 potentially even 2040 for for some of those um, line hall and remote area uh, applications so i guess part of the current reality is that operators are only going to embrace this technology if it's commercially viable the tracking industry runs on very low margins um, and there needs to be certainty for operators to take up this technology. We have a road user charging system that's fundamentally flawed, that it, it relies on sort of fuel excise moving forward. That's not going to work. Um, we're going to be looking at vehicles that are going to have different mass limits depending on the technologies um, that they're um, deploying. Um, so that needs to be taken into account. And there need to be sort of environmental levies, not only for so two emissions, but also for, for noxious emissions. 80% of trucking businesses in Australia operate five or less trucks. So I guess we're used to seeing sort of the Lynn Foxes and the Tolls and sort of those big names, but the reality is that 80% of trucking businesses are mum and dad operators. Those organisations are not going to take the punt on these new technologies until they're proven, until they're proven not only in terms of their reliability, but more so in terms of sort of their economics because you can't afford to have, you know, in five trucks, you, you put on two or three sort of you know, uh, zero emission vehicles and they, they don't um, live up to your sort of financial expectations. You can't have, uh, can't afford to have 20, 30, 40, 50% of your business underperforming. 
Last year, we sold uh, almost 44,500 trucks. 27 of those were battery electric. So we have a long, long way to go. There's been a fair uptick this year. So far, um, sales are running at about half a percent, uh, which doesn't sound much, but it's actually a lot more than 27 trucks uh, we've sold this year. But it means that 99.5% of the trucks that we've sold this year and we will sell this year are still diesel. If you look, we have a very old truck fleet compared to the rest of the world. Um, the numbers in uh, January 21 were um, 15 years average age. So that's average age. So sort of trucks sold today in 2023 will potentially still be on the road in 2053. So that's a, a pretty sobering thought. So it's a very conservative industry. There needs to be significant change, I guess, to to uh, turn over the fleet, we're going to have to significantly reduce sort of the fleet age, or we need to find an alternative fuel to run that existing fleet on. So we've done a fair bit of modelling, um, uh, looking at sort of what technologies we will see between now and 2030. We haven't done a lot of work beyond 2030 because uh, I think that we're going to see significant changes in the technology, particularly sort of with battery and, and hydrogen. Um, beyond 2030, beyond 2035. But I think that sort of it's the next 10 to 15 years that are, uh, as part of that transition, we really need to, to focus on. So we believe that um, by 2030, one in four new trucks will be uh, battery electric or hydrogen. Uh, so that's a, uh, a significant shift from where we are at the moment, from half a, of half a percent of truck sales to 25% of truck sales in, in just seven years' time are going to be sort of, you know, a zero emission. Um, if you account for sort of all the truck sales between now and then, that means about 20,000 zero emission trucks on our roads. So that just res represents 2% of our fleet uh, by 2030. That means that uh, by 2030, that 98% of trucks in Australia are still going to require diesel. Uh, the take-up will start in city and urban applications with light-duty trucks and medium um, and some heavy-duty for trucks for volume freight. And as I said before, mass-constrained freight, line haul and remote area freight um, are going to be the last of the segments to transition because they're really the technology doesn't exist or it doesn't exist in terms of you know, operating a truck viably at the moment. So our modelling suggests that 2% um, that of the fleet will be zero emission by 2030. Um, another 1% of carbon um, can be abated across the fleet uh, with uh, diesel electric hybrids, and we believe that uh, we're on track to, to reach that. Um, and the implementation of Euro 6 uh, diesel engines, which started a few years ago but uh, will be mandated from um, 2025 onward will result in another 2% of CO2 emissions. So between now and uh, 2030, we believe we're on target, if we do nothing else, to hit about a 5% um, CO2 reduction across the fleet, which is nothing like the 43% or even the 12% that sort of Europe are planning. Uh, if we keep those three, um, we also believe there's some significant gains to be had with high productivity vehicles. Uh, if you look at sort of our two major freight routes, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, uh, about 60% of consumer freight runs on those two routes. 50% um, of the trucks, the artic articulated trucks running on those uh, routes are still semi-trailers. So we can move a lot more freight with more efficient combinations like B-doubles or A-doubles, but there needs to be some regulatory reform. There needs to be some mechanism of consolidating freight for those smaller operators so they can actually ensure that their trucks are, those larger trucks are fully loaded and they're not, not running sort of just, um, you know, towing trailers full of air. Um, but if we can, we believe sort of there's, there's another 2% sort of um, CO2 savings to be gained by sort of um, moving freight more productively. So that takes us to 7%. What we need is something we can actually run across the entire fleet. So if you looked at an R5 or a B5 fuel uh, across the entire fleet, that'll give you another 5%. So that actually gets us to 12% with those other measures. If we went uh, an R10 fuel across the fleet, then that gives us a 17% CO2 reduction across trans heavy vehicle transport uh, by uh, 2030. So I guess you can see that um, if, if you look at sort of 
what we are doing. Uh, the only way that we're going to make significant differences sort of in, in uh, heavy vehicle road transport is with the, the uh, with renewable fuels. So um, I'll leave it there. But um, yeah, that's sort of the, the situation. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name's um, Amy Philbrook. I'm from Arup and I'm actually joined here today by my colleague, Sean, who uh, leads the waste solutions business for, for Arup in the region. And so delighted to be here and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, interestingly, my title is Hydrogen Technical Lead for Australasia for, for Arup. Um, and so for the past three years, I've been talking about hydrogen um, and also getting really hard questions about hydrogen, like, you know, when is hydrogen going to be $2 a kilogram? How can I make hydrogen for $2 a kilogram? So um, today, really looking forward to um, some easier questions and and very much. Um, <laughs> um, and it's it's nice to be back in the biofuels space again. So Arup, um, Arup is a, is a massive um, firm of engineers, design, and architects. Um, we have 18,000 people headquartered in London. Um, in Australia, Arup came to Australia to implement the design of the Sydney Opera House in 1963. And what I learned this week is that Arup actually did the design for, for this building that we're in. Um, and so very big and sustainable buildings um, and infrastructure. Um, and, and very well known for that. So in Canberra, like have done a lot of the um, national, have done the National Museum, for for example, very big in rail, um, very big in port infrastructure as well. So we are growing in energy. Um, we're, we have significant expertise in um, in the UK and Singapore, and we're stealing these people um, to our Sydney office um, because of this great opportunity that there is in Australia and um, the reason why we're all here. Um, Arup is a firm that will not support fossil projects. And what that has done is given us a real edge in terms of growing and getting graduates. Because as you know, the, the younger generation, it finds this the most important thing. And this has given us the ability to grow by tenfold um, in the last two years. So rail in Australia, and I'll probably be reiterating a lot of the points that Abigail made and, and some that Mark made today. Um, I thought all of our talks would be different, but in fact, it's kind of the same thing. And so what we know is that the slow uptake of hydrogen has really presented an opportunity for, for biofuels. And as we know, the transport sector is a hard to abate um, sector in Australia. And so it's opening up this door. And I think that like flavor of the month, renewable diesel, and um, so I'll be talking a little bit about renewable diesel today. So you can see in the graph that um, the volume of freight carried in Australia is expected to grow by over 35%. And if we look at the little icons, we can see that rail is really um, up there in terms of um, pushing materials around in Australia. Um, only 10% of rail in Australia is electrified. Uh, we expect the safeguard mechanism to start to impact some decisions of some of these major rail, rail operators. As I said, the slow uptake of hydrogen is presenting an opportunity for renewable diesel. And locomotives are four times more efficient than heavy vehicles. So what we see in some overseas business decisions is first, let's move to rail and then let's decarbonize rail. So I think that's a really interesting fact that, you know, rail is not that inefficient. It has the ability to carry a lot of load uh, with very small relative use of fuel. So rail in Australia, and just kind of uh, reiterating Mark's point, is that these locomotives are around for a long time. So less than 51% of local, or greater than 51% of locomotives are less than 15 years old. So the business decision to kind of convert these vehicles to hydrogen or, or some other form of engine that can take alternative fuels is, is, is really limited. Um, and interestingly, 21% of locomotives are over 35 years old, and some locomotives in Australia are more than 50 years old. So we have that long lifetime to um, consider, and we also have these long routes on, in the map. So um, 
you know, the electrification of the long routes and the heavy haulage is, is challenging. And um, hydrogen has like a whole set of other challenges that I won't be talking about um, today. They've kind of been mentioned a little bit previously. So renewable diesel and biodiesel, and Abigail went over this, and so I will do that quickly. Uh, there's two standards in Australia, biodiesel standard and diesel standard. Uh, renewable diesel fits under the diesel standard, and that was work done by Bioenergy Australia to get that included. And so just to kind of talk about the two differences, and I think that biofuels really, you know, kind of sometimes kicks itself in the foot with all these terms and all these terminologies as a first generation, second generation advance. And, and so we're, just with biodiesel and renewable diesel, you can see that biodiesel is made from oils, um, undergoes a chemical process with a catalyst to make um, biodiesel. Um, renewable diesel is considered a drop in fuel. People say it's chemically equivalent. You wouldn't necessarily necessarily say it's chemically equivalent, um, but it is a drop-in fuel, and so therefore you can, in theory, replace 100% of your fossil diesel with renewable diesel. And so there's many different sources of biomass that can be used to make renewable diesel. The black box is the conversion technology. There's many different conversion technologies, and we've heard about one today, and I think we're hearing about more this afternoon. Um, it's then hydro treated as a, in a similar way that um, petroleum diesel is hydro treated um, to make renewable diesel. So recent announcements. And so this is what I mean, like kind of flavor of the month. And it was really interesting to hear Land Lease's um, presentation. I didn't appreciate that they were importing uh, renewable diesel. So if, if you look at kind of the dates on these, it's all in the last six months, right? And I think that people are realizing that renewable diesel really provides a lot of advantages that, that I'll kind of be going over in the end. So um, ACE is um, operates in California and they've committed or announced to using 100% renewable diesel in their in their um, in their operations. Um, the middle one is actually Panrail and Chevron. So they actually op uh, operate over 8,000 locomotives in um, in the United States. And just by kind of comparison, there's about 2,000 locomotives in Australia. So 8,000 just by this one company. And they have stated that they're going to be, that they will use um, renewable diesel as it is available at different blends to in all of their 8,000 uh, locomotives. Um, and then one of the biggest rail operators in um, Germany has recently partnered with Neste. Um, and they've announced that they'll be using renewable diesel in, in a thousand of their um, locomotives. So as you can see, like there's, there's a transition happening there um, that um, we will hopefully see in Australia as well. So again, the options and, and as you're making commercial decisions, have to consider all of these options. So, so the first one is what land leases option is uh, import low carbon fuel. Um, pay the premium for, for renewable diesel and, and use that to get that carbon benefit. Uh, local producers, and I'll, I'll spend a bit of time talking about that at the next slide, but Australia is in no shortage of groundbreaking technologies um, and the use of offsets. And I know it's a bit of a dirty word, but if you're kind of considering your business decisions, you have to consider offsets. offsets. And if that is gonna be a more economic choice, to, to, to using these alternative fuels. And then there's hydrogen and e-fuels. And I think the same message that everyone's given today is that, hey, maybe 2040, um, but right now as we're kind of reaching these 2030 targets, we need more practical um, solutions to decarbonize our transport sector. So final slide is just um, to talk about the advantages of renewable diesel for rail. And potentially this covers heavy vehicles and, and other um, users of diesel. The drop in fuels and, you know, as I said, with hydrogen, there's so many different standards and safety considerations to take into account if you're going to transition to hydrogen that you just don't see um, with renewable diesel. Um, complementary of the long lifetime of locomotives and potentially trucks. Um, ready now and currently used in locomotives overseas. So kind of that testing and that kind of you know, fear of first use has kind of been overcome by um, operations overseas. Ability to transition to net zero. And so I'm, I'm a fan of biodiesel as well. But as, as was said earlier, you, you don't really run into those top limits using existing um, engines if you use renewable diesel compared to biodiesel. 
Um, we have an Australian standard, uh, lesser cost than hydrogen. No one can make hydrogen for two dollars um, a kilogram, which is kind of required to 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 make these <laughs> propositions um, commercial. And there's good funding support, and you know, it's we all know that the policies in the United States and in Europe, and they've been presented really well today, have resulted in the uptake of these alternative fuels, and we do not yet have those strong support policy levers here in Australia. But if we focus on the positive, we do have a arena that, and uh, Martin has told us that invested over $130 million in, in bioenergy projects. And certainly they're, they're open to, um, to seeing more projects. And it's fantastic to see that SAF announcement. There's also the Industrial Decarbonization Fund being run by ARENA. And to me, this kind of really fits well with the rail industry and potentially the, the trucking industry. And these world leading local technologies. So unquestionably, Australia has a field of talent in the development of some of these newer technologies. And, and we, we've seen those funded by ARENA, but to really get that uptake and to kind of compete with the importation of renewable diesel, you really need that strong solid policy support to, to, to drive that change. So that's it for me today. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Fabiano Chimenez. I'm a senior research scientist with New South Wales DPI. And firstly, thank you, Simon, for getting my pronunciation of my surname right. That's um, impressive. Um, so it's going to be a very quick overview of some work we've been doing with our colleagues from CSIRO. Myself and Keith Carney here from New South Wales DPI, we've been developing this tool, uh, which we're calling the New South Wales BioSmart, which stands for Spatial and Modular Assessment of Resources Tool. And that's to bring you back to the feedstock theme. So this is not about uh, necessarily looking at uh, a tool for liquid biofuels only, but it's for any bioproducts. What's the need? Um, so we know that there is a lack of um, easy to access information on biomass availability, not just in New South Wales, but across Australia. Uh, that's one of the number one concerns that industry voices to us all the time. Um, Understanding around volumes is one thing, but the other important element is understanding the spatial availability of the biomass. So that's where we've been concentrating a lot of our efforts in the last few years. And then how do we link the biomass with the range of potential markets out there? So to give you a quick idea of the work we've been doing, uh, we within New South Wales DPI led the New South Wales component of the Australian Biomass for Bioenergy Assessment work. And uh, if you want to find out a bit more about the data that's there, that's the website there for you to have a look at for New South Wales. Um, and it's basically was an exercise in understanding, you know, what is the potential availability of biomass for New South Wales for different, um, from different industry sources. And obviously um, it's a very large number. I think Sarah quoted that before in her presentation, um, but for New South Wales, conservatively speaking, we estimate at least 22 million tonnes of uh, existing biomass from, you know, existing sources. It sounds like a lot, it is, it is a lot, um, but there are challenges, you know, accessing the biomass. Um, it's not necessarily where you need it to be. So quite often it's geographically constrained. Uh, there may be issues around regulation. Um, so, and, you know, if you're talking about different industries with large demand pools around the biomass, um, even though it sounds like a huge amount of volume, soon the the volume will become quite, um, you know, exhausted quite quickly. If you're talking about liquid biofuels, if you're talking about industrial heat, electricity generation options, biochar. So all those industries are quite, you know, uh, high biomass demand industries. So it's important to understand that, you know, that figure may not actually go a long way. So that's why part of the work we've been doing over the last few years is understanding the potential for growing biomass crops or dedicated biomass crops for the purposes of supplying a bioeconomy industry. I'm not going to go into the detail of the work, but we've got about 60,000 trees growing across New South Wales in different trial sites, um, different native species um, on a very short rotation cycle. We're talking about three or four year rotation cycles. And the reason why we're going for trees is that little diagram on the top uh, talks about 
you know, it's not just about the fiber production, but it's all the ecosystem benefits that you get as well. So from a farmer's perspective, it's about accessing low um, productivity land. So it's not about competing um, with traditional cropping industries because it's never it's never going to be economically viable to do so anyway. Uh, but there's a huge area of uh, land in New South Wales and across Australia that's currently underutilized um, and it could be used for the purposes of growing biomass crops. And that's what this work is, you know, that's what the target of this work is. And, you know, if you're talking about trees, they're highly adaptable across different landscapes in Australia. So if you understand your native, native trees and you know, demand in terms of soil, rainfall, et cetera, uh, you can easily match the right species to the right climate. So that's what this work is all about, and also understanding the ecosystem benefits that you get. So it's not just about income diversification for the landholder, you know, potential for integration to farming systems, but also looking at things like how can we use those those trees as a tool to improve soil health, as a tool to improve you know biodiversity outcomes, etc. So, and and importantly as well, in those trees, they um, you're able to access carbon credits via AQs under the current emissions reduction fund. So it's an opportunity and there's a lot more information on the website. So this talk is not about this, but it's just to, to mention that it's a very important element. So a quick demo of the um, tool. Uh, hopefully it's a little video that I have here because I know the perils of live demo. Um, so we made this um, video for you that hopefully will work um, since we're working now. So this is an example of using uh, biomass for a particular application, in this case for uh, concentrated solar power and biomass system that we're interested in the Griffith region of New South Wales. And you can see here that you can turn the topographic or satellite pictures on, you can look at solar exposure or solar irradiation uh, index for that region. We can look at the biomass, different biomass uh, crops or the different crops, the residues from different sources, in this case, agricultural crops, and then we can look at building a, uh, an area of interest where you want to access the biomass from. In this case, we're building this, uh, drawing this little uh, polygon, which now is defining the area where you're interested in accessing the biomass. So the, the tool is thinking about producing that output. That, that's why you can see that, and that, that's the output there in terms of the biomass availability for that region. So it gives you the different biomass types both on a dry weight perspective and a wet weight perspective, because it's part from, from a transport issue as well. And you can turn things on and off. If you're not interested in livestock waste or solid organic waste, you can turn that off. Or if you want to reduce the amount of biomass that you want to access for a particular project, you can do this as well. Um, so next point is to say, okay, I'm interested in growing biomass crops as well. So I, you can define a region, any region in your South Wales, and then um, the tool will ca calculate what is the proportion, what is the size of the area that you want to grow. So in that case, it's about 1,800 hectares from here. Um, and you can change that, or you can sort of keep that as an area that you're interested in. And then it gives you options in terms of the types of trees that you want to grow in that land as well. And then as an output, it gives you the likely productivity after you harvest those trees after three or four years. So that's one element. So let's define your feedstock base. And then you can link those feedstock sources with where you want them to be used. And to that end, you can, um, it's a demonstration here of the different things you can do. You can define a transport hub, which is basically an area where, where you move the biomass to a centralized location. You can define a pelletizing facility, for instance, if you want to pelletize the biomass. And you can have an end use as your power station or industrial heat or liquid bio or your refinery or whatever it may be. So th this is just demonstrating how you can link the biomass sources with the model, with the tool. It calculates what is the best transport route for the biomass and also has an output in terms of CO2 emissions and costs of moving the biomass as well. So that's uh, in the process of creating those links. So linking up the biomass with the different nodes, as we call them in the model, the tool. So that's all that's being done there now. So it's all being created. So now we are ready to uh, basically look at substations and transmission lines as well. So if you're interested in electricity generation, then the model already has embedded the substations available for the region and also gives it the ability to build transmission lines if that is your interest. Obviously not so important from a liquid biofuel perspective, but from an electricity generation perspective, it's quite important. Um, so then we've got the model set up to run. So everything's ready. You go to the settings and then we just run the model and then you take you to an output window. And it gives you a summary of 
the whole, you know, the total biomass availability for that region, and both in a tabular format and the graph format. Power generation. So if you're looking at, um, for instance, in this case, a hybrid power facility, you know, biomass and solar, you know, how much of that need is met by the existing biomass. And I don't know if you caught it was very quickly, but um, you know the biomass from that region was enough to feed three and a half times a five megawatt facility for that region, right? So you can go back and change any parameters that you like. You can change um, the energy content of the different feedstocks if you've got you know a different um, value. So all the default values can be changed by the user. Um, you know things like uh, you can change the plant size, for instance. You say, well, I want to change from five megawatt to fifty megawatt facility. Um, what would that do to the feedstock availability and to the feedstock needs of that particular facility? So you run it, run it again, and then you can see that it only meets 55% of a 50 megawatt facility. So you can play with the values in any way you want, right? And this is just for, from a power generation perspective, but the same capabilities will be available for liquid biofuel production, for industrial heat, for biochar, and for a number of other applications as well. And I think it's just showing here now the capabilities around, you know, they can change the fuel cost if you have a different value for that. If you have any different values for, um, you know, any of the essential parameters underlying the model that can be changed by, by, by the user. And then you can, once you're happy with it, you can save it and you can upload it and then it becomes your, basically your output. Um, so that's still under development. It's not quite finalized yet. Um, so we are hoping that in the next few weeks or so it will be publicly available. So, and then I'm just asking you that if you're interested in this, and that's something that might be of use to you, uh, to please register your interest by sending an email to me, and then I'm gonna build a, a distribution list. And then hopefully um, in a few weeks time, you get an email from us saying it's currently available. That's it, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Hopefully that's high enough. Um, thanks for the invite to talk today. My name's Keith Sharp, Engineering Manager at TFA Project Group. We're a consulting firm who specialise in fuel infrastructure. For 26 years, we've been designing major oil terminals, airport fuel farms and refuelling facilities, anything to do with fuel, including 25% of all the service stations in Australia. In terms of biofuels, we've been involved from around about 2021, 22 years ago. I went on the seven year journey to build the Dolby biorefinery. It was a long journey in those days, and sadly, it's the only biorefinery to be built in the last 20 or so years of scale like that to produce ethanol, and that was a sorghum to ethanol plant. We've also been involved in many feasibility studies, probably for a dozen different biorefineries in the last 15 years. Sadly, none of those have progressed, although currently we've been doing work with Jet Zero. Over the last couple of years, we've been uh, producing some white papers. Uh, we did the first white paper on electric vehicles, the second one on hydrogen, and earlier this year, we did a study on sustainable liquid fuels, which we released in July. So sustainable liquid fuels, they've gone gangbusters around the world, but they haven't progressed in Australia. We're talking 1,200 plants, 175 billion litres a year of production, over 2 million jobs globally, fuel security and drop in fuel options today. But it begs the question why Australia hasn't actually pursued them as well. So looking just the, the starting point, electric vehicles are obviously coming. Five years ago, the Australian Electric Vehicle Market Study was released. And for a long time, we followed the bottom red line with FPT incentives. We're now up to about 7% of sales, which is sort of halfway between the two red lines. At this rate, according to those predictions, will be about 80% electric passenger vehicles by 2050. That still means there'll be a need for petrol. So in terms of hydrogen, the hydrogen roadmap came out about the same time, but hydrogen hasn't progressed that far for transport because there's a lot of options, not, not the least of which we've got 500,000 tonnes a year of grey hydrogen made in Australia that's used industrially for refining and fertiliser. So there's a, a fair priority to replace that first with green hydrogen, but there are also other options, industrial heat, power, export projects being talked about, and two options in transport. One obviously is a fuel cell fuel, which means you've got to get fuel cell vehicles. The second one is, is interesting and I'll talk about more later, but it can be used as a feedstock to turn carbon dioxide into sustainable liquid fuels that can go through our existing infrastructure and vehicles. Now, interestingly, the US Department of Energy came out with their fact sheet earlier this year. 
And the notable thing is light vehicle duties, future for hydrogen zero, according to them. Uh, notable thing though on sustainable liquid fuels through up to and beyond 2050 is there's a lot of boxes there where there will be still a future need for sustainable liquid fuels. Similar picture came out in the Queensland Sustainable Liquid Fuels Policy recently, which has the four different options. The second from the bottom is sustainable liquid fuels. And about 18 months ago, the government engaged uh, some modelling on the future of sustainable or future of liquid fuels, I should say, with the potential being 22 to 42 billion litres in 2050, subject to the rate of change in technology being adopted. So a lot more than you might think with electric vehicles coming and the potential of hydrogen. But this was the modelling at the time. And so the purpose of our white paper was to say, well, if we look at a target of roughly 30 billion litres of liquid fuels required by 2050, do we have the feedstocks and can we? is it realistic that we could make them? So this is the IEA technology roadmap. And it's probably four or five years out of date now. And it's there's a lot more options that you could put on the chart, but I couldn't bother to try. It's just pretty crowded. There are a lot of options. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, ethanol and biodiesel were the only options in town. Now we have different options. The top left one there is the Neste Singapore HVO plant. Um, that has just been doubled in size from 500, billion litres, uh, 500 million litres a year to a billion litres. It makes renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel from, ironically, a lot of Australian tallow and various vegetable oils that they source. The bottom left is the Praj lignocellulosic plant in India, which was commissioned about 12 months ago, turning rice straw into ethanol. And on the bottom right is the Lanzajet alcohol to jet fuel plant in Georgia, USA. So we've got different ways of making our sustainable liquid fuels, certainly ability to make ethanol from variety of sources, then the ability to turn ethanol into not only jet fuel, but renewable diesel as well. And then we have some of the technologies coming in over the last five years, which I, I really believe could be quite a significant game changer in terms of making enough. There has been technology around for three or four years, uh, such as the Lanza Tech plant in China there. There have got three plants in China which are taking steel mill off gases and emissions and turning them into ethanol. And one of those plants has been working for four years now, but they've got three plants working, taking steel mill emissions and turning them into ethanol. Uh, the top left plant is the HEF plant in Chile, and they are taking carbon dioxide, and you do need a source of hydrogen for this, and they're using e-fuel technology to make e-methanol and e-gasoline. So you have the option to make petrol as well, renewably, and then you can take that further with fissure trove technology to make renewable diesel and uh, jet fuel as well. Importantly, all these technologies need to achieve the greenhouse gas savings. And the good news is that most of them are achieving around about 80, 90% of all these technologies, which is not much different to what you could have achieved with electric vehicles and hydrogen. But the big thing is these are technologies that can use our existing infrastructure and existing vehicles. So looking at the feedstocks, and that's the big question. For starters, there's the existing biofuels feedstocks that we grow in Australia for the benefit of everybody else right now. Uh, a million tonnes of canola off to Europe for biodiesel, half a million tonnes of tallow to Neste in Singapore to make that renewable diesel and SAF that's sent to America. Um, if we were to use that here, that's around about a billion litres of production. Not a big number compared to 30 billion, but that's feedstocks that we're sending overseas and we're using Australian land for this benefit for other countries. So there's been a few discussions about biomass and waste this morning. Um, we wrote this paper earlier this year before the update from the CSRO came out. Previous estimates 80, they're now saying 78, they're still on target. Uh, interestingly, up to 114 million tonnes by 2050. And if you look at the raw numbers, that's a potential of 18 billion litres. That's that's great. It's almost, it's just over half, but that's 100%. And as people have said today, it's unlikely we'll get to use 100% of that available biomass. But there's certainly a potential for a significant amount of sustainable liquid fuels from your biomass and waste. And it differs by the source. Uh, some of the things like wheat straw, there's 10 million tonnes a year of wheat straw burnt in the field in Victoria. So some feedstocks are more available than others, but it needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, this is the big one that I see. Uh, Australia produces 520 million tonnes a year of carbon dioxide equivalent, roughly. Uh, 
a breakdown to the bottom right hand corner. And interestingly, around about a quarter of that is covered in the safeguard mechanism with about 219 countries who are the top emitters who will individually uh, produce around 100,000 tonnes a year or more. So the safeguard mechanism is publicly available. So we went through that and had a look at the companies who run major manufacturing facilities where it would be potentially possible to collect those emissions. So a lot of coal mines have leaks and emissions from open cut coal mines. We excluded those and looked at major manufacturing facilities such as steel mills. The number we came up with was in the order of 70 million tonnes a year if we excluded methane completely, just focused on carbon dioxide emissions. And that is a huge resource. We're talking potentially 25 billion litres a year of sustainable liquid fuels. This is from existing emissions. Uh, on top of that, you can do direct air capture of carbon dioxide, but that's harder because there's not much concentration of carbon dioxide in the air. But as a resource, Woodside are already looking at this technology to uh, do a project in Australia. And as I said, there's three projects already in China taking steel mill emissions and converting them into ethanol. So a lot of this technology is, is to produce ethanol, although you can use the e-fuel technology as well to get your gasolines. So when you add all those together, roughly the 30 billion litres I started off with is around about 65% of the theoretical number. Now, it all comes down to availability and allocation of those resources. But the interesting thing about the emissions is that we have a safeguard mechanism. We have a mandate that people need to reduce their emissions by about 4.9% a year. And there are financial incentives to do that or penalties. And a lot of people only have carbon capture and sequestration as an option. That's a black hole you have to keep paying forever. And companies like Chevron with the Gorgon project are already capturing their carbon dioxide, but they're paying to inject it into the ground. So to convert it into sustainable liquid fuels actually creates an income stream as an alternative, is effective in reducing emissions, but also helps decarbonise Australian transport. So just on the final slide, we had a look at potential for additional capacity. And obviously, Australia is very secure in terms of our food supplies. We only use 4% of the country for crops. We export 71% of our agriculture anyway. So we're very much export orientated. Our sugar exports, uh, our sugar mills have struggled over time. We've had a few closures, but those sugar exports, exports potentially could be another billion litres a year. Uh, the HEFA technology or HVO, BP and Ampol, are performing feasibility studies at the moment for two projects, total about a billion litres a year. And one of the potential feedstocks there is Brassica carinata, which is the third one from the bottom, on from the bottom left. Um, that can be used as a break crop for canola and wheat fields. And that alone could actually almost satisfy their need for feedstocks. Otherwise, they've got to compete with Neste for our tallow and canola. Also, there are crops that are suitable for non-arable land, which covers a lot of the country. About 45% of Australia is classified grazing native vegetation, but there are crops like agave, which is a Mexican cactus, bottom left, they use that to make tequila. So there's sugar in there and biomass. Uh, great for arid areas. Also the Pongamia tree is an oil seed. And we, we just had a, a bit of a sensitivity. Obviously algae is there, but it's incredibly space efficient, but it's also very expensive as well. So we focused on uh, agave and Pongamia and roughly 0.3% of Australia planted with either of those will give you another 10 to 13 billion litres of feedstocks. That's just a sensitivity type thing. Anyway, I might leave it there and uh, happy to answer questions during the panel. The white paper is available. Oop. There is a link on the last page anyway, but it won't come up to the white paper. It'll be in what gets released. Thank you. Excellent. Hello, everybody. My name is Shafak Rahman, and I'm the Deputy Chief Commercial Officer at Spitzer Australia. And I'd also like to reiterate the acknowledgement to country and the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So before we start, I'd like to give you a quick overview of who Spitzer is and what we do. So Spitzer is a, is a global marine towage organization and we provide, um, we operate in 33 countries and uh, in 147 ports and terminals across the world. 
And what that means is that we do, we provide 140,000 tug assists a year. And in reality, what that means is every three minutes, there's a tug job that's done by Switzer somewhere in the world. We are a, um, a subsidiary, wholly owned subsidiary of the MERS group, and uh, we operate in four regions, and one of them is, is Australia in Sydney. Um, when coming today in, to talk to you about this, I just thought about how do we phrase this, the decarbonization challenge in the maritime sector. So I'd like to ask you guys, um, looking at the pictures on the screen, what do you think these two pictures have in common? You can go popcorn style, whoever wants to pop first. Anyone? Excellent. <laughs> So the mar maritime sector contributes about two and a half percent of um, global CO2 emissions. That's about the size of uh, the total carbon um, output, carbon emissions of a country like Germany. That just puts it in context of where we actually sit in the in the pecking order. If we are to zoom into tugs, um, according to the International Maritime Organization. Tugs contribute about 41 million tons of uh, CO2 emissions a year, and that was in 2018. That number's only increased. This is comparable to emissions from shipping segments like small bulkies, or I'm using a, a, a slang that we use, but small um, cape sized bulk carriers or small container liner vessels. So it's not an insignificant number. Interestingly, towage is not part of the emission reduction targets that are set by IMO. But as a responsible towage operator, we take it upon ourselves to be a part of the solution and take steps to decarbonize our operations. In July this year, the IMO released its revision of the uh, 2018 greenhouse gas emission targets. A couple of interesting things came out of that. So firstly, um, there was um, the member states agreed to reduce by their greenhouse gas emissions by or around 2050. And then there were some indicative checkpoints that were agreed, which talked to a 20% reduction by 2030, striving for 30%, and then 70% reduction by 2040, striving for 80%. Now, these two things are super interesting because previously, um, there was a 50% reduction by 2050, and there was no intermediate checkpoints that were placed before. So these are quite a significant change that we've noticed in the maritime sector. So, sorry. So while the emission and targets are actually becoming more stringent and, and more focused, but within shipping sector, the emissions are actually increasing. And, and shipping's pretty much rebounded back from where it was when it took a dip in 2020. To now 2022, it's pretty much gone up by about 15, by about five percent. So against this backdrop, it's critical that shipping companies try play their part in figuring out um, how we are going to decarbonize. So why then is a tugboat company coming and talking to you about um, carbon emissions? We've been around for about 190 years, and during that time, we've transformed many times. For us, the need to respond to climate action is part of our future sustainability to continue to operate and also to meet the expectations of being able to sustainably exist in future. We've taken a lead in the industry and set ourselves to very ambitious goals of 50% um, reduction by 2030 and to be fully carbon neutral by 2040. Now, these, are, these ambition targets go beyond any um, constraints set on us by the industry or by our broader business obligations. And I'd also like to point out that they are not driven by any current regulatory environment as well. So to give you an idea of our decarbonization challenge, our fleet is pretty complex. And that's what we've heard from everybody, from the, the truck council as well, and, and from the infrastructure players like Lendley's. Um, the key challenge for us is that we've got about 440 vessels that, that exist in our operations, and they're equivalent to about emissions um, uh, generated by about 100,000 100, diesel cars 
um, in, in same terms, in terms of CO2 emissions. So for us, the big challenge is that there's no standard tug. All these tugs operate in multiple geographies with different propulsion types, different engines. So we aren't able to then um, figure out one solution and apply it across the board. The other challenge that we face is that our assets are pretty long lasting and they can go up to about 40 to 50 years in most cases. So we then need to act now if we are going to meet our obligation to um, reach carbon neutrality by 2040. A quick note on our scope to emissions. While they are small, we've made quite a bit of progress on this. And what we've been able to achieve there is that by 2025, our landside operations will be fully carbon neutral, either through renewable um, electricity or via green powered electricity contracts. And we welcome the opportunity to work with ports to be able to partner with them on renewable electricity, particularly solar. So the obvious question that comes up is, can we not build our way out of this to net zero? So the challenge here is that on average, every year we build about 10 tugs as part of our fleet replacement strategy and in line with our contracts. If we had to build our way out of this, we'd have to build 24 tugs every year from now till about 2040. And what that, the challenges that that poses us is that A, there's no zero emission tug that's available right now that we can deploy on the water. Second, we don't have a blank check for renewal. And the third one is that these assets have a long life. And what would we do with the ones that we, we re replace? We scrap them. We simply can't build our way out of, uh, out of this situation. And, and we can't sit back and expect a single solution to solve all our problems in all geographies. So instead, what we've done is we've taken a multiple three-pronged approach. Pretty much we've looked at behavior, which um, as you said, uh, Abigail, is the low hanging fruit. It's the first thing that we can do in terms of how do you modify behavior. So what we started with was tracking the, the behavior of uh, tug operators or tug drivers to pretty much see how they mobilize and demobilize the vessel. And looking at this initiative, we were able to achieve a 10% reduction in CO2 emissions over the last two years. And based on our experience, we feel that this is, this is scalable and we can utilize this to be able to look at, to um, monitor and manage the, the emissions within ports um, all across the world. The second thing that we look at is equipment. So here we're looking at things like uh, more efficient engines, um, new tug designs, clever mechanical um, operations within the tugs where fuel efficiency is reduced and by, um, by extension then carbon emissions are also reduced. Then we're also building our tugs in a way that they can be retrofitted at a point when the better technology becomes available. And we are all conscious of that, that this is still a, 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 an area that's nascent. The other part that we've looked at and we've been asked many times that why don't you just look at an electric tug? And of course the challenges that poses as well. So we are looking at the entire array of electric cells as well as fuel cells. Lastly, and, and we're looking at fuel, which is no surprise why we're here. So here we've looked at short and long-term opportunities on fuel, and, and there we are looking at methanol, which is what's also backed by our parent company, um, Maersk, for their container liner vessels. We've looked at ammonia and hydrogen like everybody else, but it, within the confines of tugs, they pose quite significant problems. One's, of course, toxicity, and the other one is volatility for hydrogen. Um, then that brings us to biofuels. And we've looked at a lot of opportunity for biofuel in, in, in Australia. And uh, we do understand the challenges that, that are posed in terms of availability, but we are willing to be an early adopter uh, for offtake for the providers should when and uh, they, they should actually move ahead with it. We are investigating trialing fame in, in our operations as well. 
Our observation as an eager participant in the decarbonisation value chain is, is the same as what I've heard this morning, that Australia is lagging behind quite significantly compared to other countries. And in our operations, we also noticed that in, on, in the UK, of course, based on, on government um, support, um, HVO is quite readily available and we are using 80, we're using it in 60 of our tugs um, operating in that region. However, replicating in Australia is, of course, filled with quite a bit of challenges. So where's the compulsion to act? If we don't do anything right now, it might be too late and it might be very difficult to, to act much later where, it, where we may be in a lot more fragmented environment where the cost of action at a later date may be much, much higher. We do acknowledge um, the work done by different organizations in supporting this. And, and it's quite heartening to hear you, uh, the, the discussion that's happened today on, um, on biofuels and on sustainable aviation fuel. And we look at other opportunities for uh, sustainable fuel, not just for the aviation sector, but also for the other sectors of the economy. Um, just bear with me for the, with the animations. Shipping is a lot more complex um, at the moment. So with aviation, there are a couple of ingredients, which is an alignment of approach between different parties and, and a common fuel pathway, as well as OEM support. In, in shipping, we haven't been able to reach there. But this is a, a good example of the kind of approach that we can potentially take. And of course, look at offsets as well. We are thankful for the efforts of organizations such as the Maritime Industry Australia, and the government uh, support and commitment of 600k for maritime um, elect, de maritime decarbonisation planning that was um, agreed that was announced in the budget um, last week. But we do feel that a lot more needs to be done in that space. Our call from you today really is that don't ignore um, maritime sector as a potential uh, for sustainable fuels as well. We do require your support to advocate for clean energy, uh, green shipping corridors, government support and legislative support. And, and we ask that you look at maritime as a potential market for sustainable fuels as well. Thank you. Thank you, team, for uh, outstanding presentations. I think you'll all agree we've got such tremendous capability in this country, and it would be a shame to not realise the full potential of that. Just before we kick into it, I'd just like to acknowledge a very important part of the equation is I believe we've got two or three, four producers in the room, uh, three domestic and one international. So I've got, uh, and I would encourage you, so I've got Peter Chomley here from Just Biodiesel, uh, Paul Hedrington, bias, from Ecotech up in, in Queensland, uh, Kirsty from Wilmar, Wilmar, I should say men. <laughs> Be better if I said Benilda, I think. <laughs> She'll kill me. No, sorry. And also from uh, Stephen from Neste in Singapore. I would all encourage you to have a chat. And, you know, this this is a, a turning point for Australia that, uh, you know, do we want to be a fuel importer? 92% of all our fossil fuels are imported. We have a genuine transition capability to support the existing incumbent producers. And we will need to rely on importation for renewable fuels. But the long game surely has to be, as we've seen with our panellists, we have the ability to grow feedstock, we have the technology, and we have the end users who are voluntary. And that's pretty exciting. Yet we, we languish so far behind the rest of the world. And I'll probably just ask you to take a moment to reflect on why that is. And rather than just talk about it, what actions we can today or take today as a group, a coalition of the willing, we like to call it, how we can get this done. So I just invite the panel to come up and take their position, so to speak.
So thank you again, guys, for uh, your very informative and inspiring presentations. It certainly gives me a lot of confidence. You know, as an organisation, we, we sort of facilitate between the manufacturing and, and the end users. So to kick, to kick things off, I was just wondering, are there some immediate questions from the audience? There's lots, lots to unpack. Have we got a, ro a ro roving microphone? Thanks. I'm Raylan Newstead from the Department of Climate Change. Uh, we've seen this morning the importance of SAF and like projections for Australia show that there's still going to be a lot of aviation fuel demand, but diesel even more going forward. When we're producing SAF, we're going to be producing renewable diesel as well. What, like, there's a lot spoken about that this morning around the need to be driving the SAF industry. What additionally do we need to do for the renewable diesel industry if we're already going to be producing it when we're doing SAF? So the key challenge for us is not just the production of the product, but also the, the ability to sell it at a price point that the markets can sustain. So that's the biggest challenge we see. And when we've spoken to customers, we don't see a lot of appetite for the green premium, um, particularly in shipping. So what actually needs to happen is that if SAF is uh, underpinning the scale, then the other uh, players in the market can potentially benefit from it as well. So that's one of the, the more clearer things that I can think of. Can I grab it? Yeah. Right through? <laughs> um, in my opinion, looking at the Deloitte stats that came out recently in the report that they did of renewable fuels, um, I don't think we can meet the demand for renewable diesel if it's only a byproduct of SAF. I think we need to have refineries that are renewable diesel in their own right. Um, I'd also like to make the point that we can't just swap everything. We actually have to decarbonize. So we do need to reduce our diesel use. We do need to electrify so that the renewable diesel is what's left. I don't think we can just swap out the, you know, the 30 billion litres that we use annually in Australia um, for renewable diesel. That that just can't happen quick enough. So there's no silver bullet. We just um, need to do that. So in, in my opinion, if making the balance between everyone having a need for these fuels, I would look at the uh, fuel use of the whole economy and balance of feedstocks against the fuels based on the economic output of the different sectors in the whole economy. I think we need to be holistic and balance this with all the different fuels. I was just going to comment on the technology options. All of the technologies that we're talking about at large scale, such as the HVO technology, can make renewable diesel and also sustainable aviation fuel. And it's the same even with alcohol to jet fuel technology. You can swing the technology to be predominantly renewable diesel or predominantly SAF, and you can swing the percentages not all the way, but you can make it uh, adjustable depending on how they run the plants. And that's quite interesting from a perspective of, you know, I talked about using our carbon emissions as a feedstock to make potentially ethanol and then using alcohol to jet fuel technology. You could actually, in the Northwest Shelf, predominantly make renewable diesel. And that's the market there where there's lots of mines using lots of diesel. But still make some SAF, which might go export or might go to the local airports. In places like Sydney, uh, you might swing towards making it more SAF specific with less renewable diesel. But you do have the option to swing the technology to, to make either or, depending on uh, what, what your market is. Thanks. So um, the reality is currently um, Australia exports feedstock to Singapore that then refines it to renewable diesel and then sells to California. So until there's a market that can compete with California, that will continue to happen. So the technology is here, the, the policy support is not here. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Tats from Sojits again. So I think today we talk a lot about feed or stock availability. I also want to know like a biogenic uh, source CO2. So like uh, it's kind of beyond like a biogenic stuff and more EFA stuff context as well. 
uh, because the fuel stock of the EFL sustainable emission fuel is pretty much green hydrogen and CO2. And a question to um, let me see, uh, Fabiana san and also Amy san like, do you have any like a public available data about uh, biogenic source CO2? And also want to know brief about like uh, the price of the biogenic CO2 in Australia because to create the EFL stuff, you know, still very, very expensive to be on 2030 or 40. But at the moment, Sojit is doing a pre feasibility study actually in Queensland together with the, uh, CES Energy and Toyo Engineering. So I would like to know the potential in New South Wales. Thank you. Thank you. I don't believe we have any data sets currently that cover that information in New South Wales. Um, it is something that we are interested in incorporating to our tool eventually um, as a potential option. Um, but I'm just aware that you know, the likes of Drex in the UK are moving quite um, fast in that direction, but I'm not aware of any particular developments here in Australia, but maybe others do, or Amy? I, th I think in Australia there's a lack of biogenic CO2. So there's Manildra and, and Wilmar um, that are processing through fermentation. Um, so there's some CO2 there. I think it, in, in general people are looking at CO2 from cement kilns in Australia. Um, and and I, don't, I don't know if that kind of counts to what you're, you're looking at. Certainly investing in capturing CO2 from fossil is, is a risk um, in Australia, but cement kilns and then there's a lot of focus on when will direct air capture be a competitive technology for e-fuels? Thank you. Um, um, Mobin Namba from Sumita, we are a technology development group uh, bridging the gap between early estate research and the first commercial use. Um, so my question is, um, um, I think I've got that question from the maritime sector and also the truck industry, and that is, um, uh, what is um, the benchmark for fuel efficiency at the moment in that sector and how much, I guess we have to work on fuel efficiency or can, how much room we have for improvement of fuel efficiency um, per megajoule or a unit of energy per kilometer traveled or yeah, shipment load? Thank you. In the, in, in the trucking sector, it, it varies quite considerably. I guess if you're talking about um, urban freight, it's quite different to um, our line haul. Um, and I, I guess it's, it's one of the things that we've been calling um, for some government policy on, and, and that's actually looking at freight efficiency versus uh, energy. Because in Australia, we tend to move freight more efficiently uh, with our longer combinations, be they B double, A doubles, road trains, more efficiently than any other country in the world. Uh, and if we're going to move um, to uh, CO2 uh, neutrality, we, we need some way of measuring that. It's not just about engine efficiency, it, it's the overall freight movement efficiency. And at the moment, there's no metric for capturing that in Australia. So that's something that needs to be done, particularly in the heavy vehicle sector. I think sort of in the light vehicle sector, it's a lot easier. Um, you can look at sort of fuel, fuel, fuel use versus, excuse me, versus distance travel. Um, but yeah, in the heavy vehicle sector, um, particularly for freight, it needs to sort of come down to, we need some sort of metric and, and, and measurement um, to be able to actually sort of measure sort of freight, freight efficiency versus uh, CO2 emissions. And I'm happy to answer it for the maritime sector. So particularly within towage, um, each port is different in terms of its geographic constraints and the intensity that's required for a tug to uh, provide a tug assist. So really, during the time when the towage is actually happen, happening, the tug is under pilot's orders. So what we then measure is the mobilization and the demobilization speed, which is where it needs to be at the sweet spot of around eight knots per, uh, at eight knots mobilizing and demobilizing speed, at which you have the maximum efficiency for the engine. Because our engines, unlike the larger um, shipping containers are not are not continuously running at a particular load. There's a lot of stop and start kind of an operation. So as a result, for us, the measure is really at the, the mobilization and demobilization speed. If we were to look across the board, it'll be, we'll be quite challenged to kind of 
uh, use the a benchmark for let's say the port of Melbourne versus in Fremantle because of the requirements of both those ports are different and the mobilization distance is different and the requirements are of course in terms of the asset type as well. So that's that's something that we we need to factor in. It's not a it's not a, a problem that can be simplified with just a a particular metric. It needs to factor a few other things. But it's a great question. Thank you. Actually, just while we go to that question, I'm just interested as as an em employer. We we've, we've got several hundred employees in our own organisation, and one of the biggest challenges we have uh, at the moment is continuing to attract talent into our business and particularly in you know, high technology and emerging technology sector like Australia. I was just curious from the panel's perspective, the, the, the value of what we do in that renewable sector, is that changing the perception and the ability to attract talent into these type of industries? Uh, I'll talk to tracking. I think it's too early to stay at this stage i mean certainly attracting uh drivers technicians in into the trucking industry is extremely difficult um but yeah uh, i think anything that will add a level of uh technical flavor sort of, uh, it, it can only be a positive in terms of um, trying to attract people and retain people in the industry but yep. at the moment i think um, it's it's very early days i can give you my own example i come from the fuel industry and I've been in the fuel industry for about 20 years. So moving from fuel into maritime shipping was quite a bit of a, uh, a difference in terms of mindset. But then it, it actually helps you understand that what you've learned in the fuel industry, how you can translate it into other industries and potentially go on that decarbonization journey because you've got a little bit more of that um, experience with it and can understand some of the potential pitfalls and, and, and thinking roadblocks as well. Um, I can speak for colleagues in um, in Lend Lease. Um, I know that individuals um, take this as a part of their their remit, and they are very passionate about um, creating a safe climate future. A lot of people take it very personally, and they do um, consider themselves guardians of the future for their children. So a lot of people are very grateful that we are doing this. They feel like it's a company they want to stay with. And in terms of that next generation, it was it was touched on um, before. I know that it's important to our graduates that, that join. Yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly I'd agree with that, that a lot of graduates coming through are very aware of climate change, the environmental obligations, and what a work in the industry that they are proud to work in. And we certainly have no trouble at all attracting graduates who want to work in this area. They really want to be working in something that they feel is making a difference. And it's still tough to get good people who have experienced engineers to, to uh, think it's across the board just because of the sheer amount of work. There's still pressure on the supply of engineers in Australia, but certainly we're finding in, in terms of the the younger graduates, they really want to work in an area that makes a difference. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Hi there. Um, my name's Scott Ryle. I work in investment research and uh, and I look after investors in the both the public and private markets. Um, and uh, and there is a huge opportunity here, but a number of you have kind of skirted around the, the policy support issues. So my, my question is, what is the the single biggest lever that you think we could use in Australia to drive the industry, please. And if we if we start with the supposition that um, that a carbon price is probably off the table because that's too politically unpalatable, um, and obviously the LCFS has worked really well in California. I'm, I'm not as familiar with the UK market that you spoke about, Abigail, and the difference between that and here, but. Uh, you know, is it as easy as just it's a tax subsidy or, or a tax credit effectively that, that gets it down to price parity or is there something else you see in the Australian market context, please? Um, I think or the research has shown that we've done is you need market signals and at the moment we don't have a market signal. So the investors are floating and hovering around Australia and aren't landing into this industry of producing renewable fuels because they don't have that security. Now the work that um, the research that we did with UQ um, as well as the Deloitte's report so that a low liquid fuel 
low, uh, low carbon liquid fuel policy like the um, California and European is the most successful way to give that assurance to, um, to investors. I think that's pretty undisputed. People talk about the um, no needing to invent the wheel. Let's just get it happening as soon as soon as possible. So I think that's a bigger thing we can do, the biggest thing we can do. I think there's some other policy drivers that are actually really key, and I touched on them before with procurement. So um, we have a lot of government spending that happens. Defence is our lar largest use of fuels. They, um, I know by the current government, are being tasked with being leaders in that space to create that demand that, that helps. But um, you, there's been so many examples uh, globally that unless you have that policy first, you're not going to get the investment. I think in the uh, the tracking sector, um, you know, we've seen environmental zones um, for both noxious uh, and CO2 emissions work really well sort of globally. We don't have anything like that in Australia. I think that there needs to be sort of... Um, some policy around that sort of at government level uh, and then that will drive drive uh, the industry into you know various solutions and obviously one of those uh, will be renewable fuels. Just a quick comment uh, bear in mind I work for New South Wales government but <laughs> um, but from a policy perspective I think a major bit of work is around working with landholders and um, to unlock the potential. I mean, we talked a lot about, you know, there's millions of tons of different amounts of biomass, but there are lots of challenges associated with actually getting hold of it. And part of it is a perception piece. So there's a lot of an educational sort of bit of work to be done in this space. And until we do that, those perceptions will be, you know, a real blockage towards um, accessing a lot of the biomass. So I think policies that sort of aim towards, you know, in engaging with landholders and actually understanding those challenges and addressing those, I think it's a, that's a major need. A few years ago, actually more than a few years ago, when uh, uh, two states in Australia were putting in their uh, ethanol mandates, um, there were a few um, bio refineries in Australia. And that was underpinned by the government support and subsidies. So when that was taken away, um, most of these refineries started shutting down. And that, and it's also no surprise why we have our tallow going overseas. So with that, that's the most obvious thing. If the government can actually support it in that sense and underpin the risk in some way for, for investors like you, that might become one of the first ways that we, we begin to see a lot more um, biorefineries happening and, and the, the tallow staying here for use in Australia for Australians. You just to finish off that argument, looking around the world, there's 64 countries with ethanol mandates. Out is one of the ones that doesn't work. I personally feel that state mandates don't work. What works most effectively around the world is fuel specification mandates. In America, there is a mandate that all, all petrol shall have 10% oxygenate. Every litre of fuel in America has 10% ethanol in it. We're talking 60 billion litres of ethanol. That's more than we use of fuel of all types in Australia. Brazil has a huge ethanol industry, same predication. You cannot buy petrol alone in Brazil. It must have ethanol in it. Uh, the Europe's just announced 2% SAF mandate. So for you to be able to legally sell jet fuel in Europe, I think it's by 2030, you've got to have 2% sustainable aviation jet fuel in it. So fuel standards work because they make it illegal to sell fuel that doesn't have it in there. Until we start following similar things, it's there's a lot of policy talk, but you need something that makes it mandatory to have it in there. And the industry can work on the most cost effective way to get it out, the best technologies, look at the feedstocks, but you've got to have certainty. Yeah, so I'll just finish um, by saying, and this is not the view of my company, but my my personal view is like bring on the carbon tax. It's a really good way to make things equal. And and you say, well, that, that's a dirty word here, but we have the safeguard mechanism that is making you reduce emissions. And if you don't reduce those emissions, you pay a penalty. So I think that is a way forward in terms of a carbon tax without calling it a carbon tax. Thank you. So we've got time for one more quick question. Just before lunch. Yeah, um, I isolated from partners group. So just two parts. Um, firstly, on the cost sort of parity with normal diesel. So how far off we, how far off that are we, and what would it take to get there? And the second part follows on a little bit to the uh, the government support mechanisms. But in terms of private sort of companies, what's the 
you know, how do you think about signing long-term offtake agreements and that sort of thing for, uh, you know, biofuels um, that would, you know, give a signal to an investor that they should develop this plant and invest the money in the plant? So in the maritime sector, I can share with you that the premium on HVO to import it from Singapore via Neste, and of course the supply chain was coming at around six times the cost of regular diesel, six to seven times. And of course, bear in mind, this is not coming in, in big container ships. Um, regular diesel and versus other types of diesel or, or fame diesel could be around two to three, depending on where you're uh, procuring it from. So that's just in the maritime sector. And the second part of your question, can you just uh, remind me? Yeah, so in, in lieu of any government support, so what would be the, uh, how do you think about signing, say, 10-year offtake agreements with a plan to, to underpin, you know, investment in that? That's, that's a great question. So to be able to take away the risk, um, happy to be a, 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 an innovator in that space and, and sign longer offtake agreements to be able to underpin that uh, decarbonization strategy as we shared. We've got very, very ambitious goals. And if we're going to have to make um, any significant move towards that, we need to be able to use um, biofuels or, or renewable fuels as a pragmatic solution. Uh, I, I sigh. Um, sorry. I'm sorry, but this conversation happens so often and the thing that's never mentioned is that the fossil fuel Diesel gets so much financial support, so it's not a level playing field. That's why we're paying a cost premium. So I personally put the efforts into levelling that premium, phase out fossil fuel subsidies or increase the financial benefits that you give renewable fuels. Thank you, though. It's an important question. Sorry to be that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think on that, that note, it's... Uh... <laughs> I was just going to say how uh, positive, and <laughs> but that that is a positive because I, I think at some stage all of us have got to go. Yeah, you know, we've been having the same conversation for a long time. Something needs to happen. But uh, please thank me in uh, <clears throat> both Ab uh, Abigail, Mark, Amy, Fabiano, Keith, and Shafak in their fantastic presentations and Q and A.